say that uh, we're coming up on the deadline for the 18th annual Human Rights Press Awards. It's the major activity of this club uh, in, in protecting press freedom and freedom of speech. It's a flagship event for us, and uh, it's great to see so many correspondents and journalists here. Uh, if you walk out, when you walk out, you will see on the left a rack that contains application forms for the Human Rights Press Awards that look like this. Please take them with you, share them with your colleagues. Uh, the deadline for entries is the coming Friday. Uh, it's open for uh, anybody who is a either a local Hong Kong journalist or a correspondent based in Asia. Uh, where the mother ship is for your company, we don't really care, uh, but if you're a correspondent in Asia, you are eligible and we want you to get in. Uh, so the more people participating, uh, the better, not only because it makes it a stronger event because it sends out, uh, but because it sends out a message that, that uh, human rights and the right to impart and receive information contained in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of, uh, of Human Rights really means something and, uh, and that we care about it and that we celebrate it and that we defend it. So on your way out the door, please uh, pick those up. They're available online, but all the information is contained um, on the forum, and we hope to see you and many of your colleagues uh, participating. So again, uh, upcoming deadline is Friday, and uh, it's, it's for TV, it's for photographs, uh, it's in English and in Chinese, so uh, no excuse for not getting in. So with that, let me say thank you for your attention and turn this over to uh, Enid Choi. Thanks, Francis. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's lunchtime panel discussion on reporting in China. My name is Enid Cho, and I'm a correspondent governor of the FCC Hong Kong. May I first remind everyone to switch off your mobile devices if you haven't done so already, in case they interfere with the discussion, also um, some of the recording devices in the room. I'd also like to refer you to our website for other lunch events coming up, including a talk on January 20th, is traditional media losing out online? Being a journalist in mainland China has never been, been easy, but is it getting harder? Exactly a year ago, journalists at the feisty Southern Weekend magazine and newspaper were so appalled by what the censors did to their paper that they went on strike. Next, the authorities started denying or delaying work visas to qualified foreign correspondents as this club and the FCC in China have noted in our December statements. So our two speakers today have all experienced uh, firsthand the challenges of reporting in China and they will help us answer those questions. Joining us by Skype from the US is Paul Mooney, a freelance journalist who has reported on China, Taiwan and Hong Kong since 1985. He's in the US now after his China visa application was denied. And we also welcome Peter Ford to the club. Um, Peter is president of the FCC China and is a Beijing-based correspondent with Christian Science Monitor. I'm sorry to inform everyone that uh, Ching Chang, who was going to join our panel today, is unwell and cannot be here. We wish him a speedy recovery. Um, so what we're going to do today is um, I'm going to ask Peter and then Paul to um, speak for uh, a few minutes each, and then we'll have um, plenty of time afterwards for questions. So please join me in welcoming our two guests today. Hello. Um, I'd like to... Uh, <coughs> thank the FCC for inviting me to be on this panel, um, although when it comes to the risks of reporting from mainland China, I must point out that my, my fellow panelist, Paul Mooney, and my would-be fellow panelist, Ching Chang, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, uh, have suffered the consequences far more seriously than I have, and uh, they've paid a much higher personal and professional price for doing their jobs in an honest and responsible manner. It's telling, I think, that uh, we're even discussing risks when it comes to reporting from China. Risks of what you expect to run when you're reporting from Syria or South Sudan. Uh, they really shouldn't be an issue when we're talking about a country at peace that aspires to be a great power that respects and promotes international rules. 
Well, the fact is that foreign correspondents do face risks and run risks in China whenever they start to look into anything that the authorities, be they the central government or local authorities, would prefer to keep hidden from public view. Uh, there might be physical risks, the risks of being beaten up when you go to, uh, to cover a story. They could be professional risks of being denied a visa and the press accreditation that you need to do your job. Uh, and frankly, uh, I find that unfortunate, not to say shameful. You'll get an idea <coughs> of the conditions under which foreign correspondents work in mainland China when I tell you that the organization that I represent, the FCCC, the Foreign Correspondents Club of China, is an illegal organization. Uh, we have no office, no splendid premises, <coughs> such as you enjoy here in Hong Kong. Um, we've been warned that if we publicize our statements, if we put out our statements about violations of our professional rights on our website in a public fashion, officers of the club will face, quote, serious, uh, serious consequences, although they've never been spelled out. I think that gives you a flavor of the, of the central government's attitude towards us. I think it, it stems, I think it's obvious it stems, from the fact that the government is not in a position to control foreign correspondence, quite as it is in a position to control local correspondence and indeed Chinese citizens in general. Um, sometimes what we do represents a challenge to, uh, to the way the government runs the country and to its international image. <coughs> so unfortunately, in all too many cases, the authorities resort to all kinds of tactics to limit our freedom. Uh, I've reported from countries all around the world for the last 30 years, and I think I can fairly say that I have never ever been in a place where it's been so hard to do my job. On the ground, uh, too often, police and thugs working with the police routinely prevent journalists from getting to places where embarrassing things are happening. I mean, that might be farmers protesting about land confiscation in favor of, of development and being paid a pittance for their land. It could be outbursts of violence in Xinjiang, which would suggest that uh, the government doesn't enjoy the popular support that it claims there. Uh, it could be lots of things. Um, and the last annual survey that we did at the FCCC of our members uncovered 63 cases where officials, police officers, or unidentified thugs had stopped reporters from working, including nine cases of outright physical violence. At another level, the government makes it extremely hard just by being secretive for reporters to find information, whether that be financial information on the way state and enterprise works or, or the government budget itself, or, or simply in the form of a straightforward explanation of what government policy is on a particular issue. Um, two or three months ago, I was invited, along with a handful of other bureau chiefs in Beijing, to um, a meeting with the State Council Information Office uh, officials, the State Council being the cabinet in China, uh, the Information Office being the, the central bureau that puts out government information. And they wanted to discuss with us how they could help us do our jobs. They were interested in knowing how we would like them to behave in order to make our jobs easier. And they were talking about websites they were putting together and social media platforms and all sorts of things. Um, and we said, well, look, the first thing we would like is a list of the spokespeople for government ministries and agencies and their mobile telephone numbers and a promise that if they're able to answer their phone and the phone is next to them, they will answer those phones when we call. Uh, we were told that was an unrealistic expectation. Um, and now we're finding that when reporters cross red lines, uh, as it appears the New York Times and Bloomberg must have done when they published articles about uh, the personal finances of relatives of China's top leaders, the government delays their press cards, the press accreditation, and thus their visas without explanation and longer than anybody else suffered, and that constitutes as far as I'm concerned, a, a threat to deny their visas. And that is straightforward interference. It's clearly an attempt to impede, to limit, and direct foreign correspondence reporting. And I think it's probably more intense now than it has been at any other time in the seven years 
that I've been in China. Uh, nor is this sort of thing limited just to the big US media who've been in the news so much over the last few weeks because of their visa problems. The government has been getting increasingly, increasingly <coughs> assertive, aggressive, call it what you will, with other media too. <coughs> in the last 12 months or so in London, Paris and Berlin, Chinese diplomats have visited the headquarters of the Financial Times, France 24, which is the French government's international TV station, and ARD, uh, a German television station, demanding that they retract stories that they had published about China and take their stories down from the websites. Uh, they didn't succeed, but uh, I think the fact they tried at all suggests that they thought they had a chance. The authorities have also kept reporters away from uh, their own ministers uh, at press conferences. A Bloomberg reporter traveling with David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, when he was in Beijing recently, was not allowed into David Cameron's press point. A French reporter for Radio France International, who had wanted to attend a press conference by his own Minister of Finance, was banned from that press conference by the uh, Chinese authorities. In this atmosphere, I think it's essential that international media should hold their ground and not give in to these attempts at intimidation. I think it's also important that Beijing should understand the potential repercussions of their threats to foreign journalists. And I think in this respect that uh, Vice President Joe Biden's conversations with Xi Jinping and other senior, gen senior Chinese officials recently when he was in Beijing, the talks he had with them about the visa issue, were they played a useful role, I think. Let me add a, a couple more personal comments before I end. I think firstly, everybody should bear in mind that the risks foreign correspondents run in mainland China are slight compared to the risks that local journalists face. As a general rule, the worst thing that could happen to us is that we will be expelled from the country or denied visas. Now, obviously, for some people like Paul Mooney, who've built their professional lives around understanding China and explaining it to the rest of the world, this is a very grave threat and a very grave punishment. Uh, it's had huge personal consequences for him, and it's completely unacceptable. But Chinese reporters, indeed any Chinese citizen who stands up for freedom, such as freedom of expression, risks suffering much more. Secondly, the rewards, because this was actually the risks and rewards of reporting in China. <clears throat> the rewards are enormous. I mean, it's a, it's a huge privilege to be as close as we are to one of the, the biggest international stories there is, however hard it may be to actually get as close as we'd like, uh, and to have an opportunity to explain or at least guess, make our best guess at what's going on to our readers and viewers. And the people we meet uh, in our daily reporting are often truly inspiring people, especially those who are brave enough to run very serious personal risks for the sake of what they believe. I think we owe it to our readers, uh, to our employers, and to the Chinese people to report honestly and fully on what we see. The Chinese government has said repeatedly that foreign reporters are welcome in China, that it wants to help us to do our job. And I think it is only by doing our job properly that we can hold the government to their word. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for a marvelous opening remark. Um, I think we now have Paul Mooney on the line. Um, no, we don't. We're going to call him again. Please bear with us for a second. can all see you here in the Centro at the FCC Clubhouse. Good, good evening. It's not a, it's not a great connection. Paul, um, can, you, can you test the connection? Um, 
Uh, yes, uh, I can hear you a bit faintly, but uh, can you hear me? Yes, it sounds loud and clear, doesn't it? Um, thank you very much for joining us today, Paul. Um, it, we, we've got a, um, almost a full house here. We just heard um, Peter um, give his introductory remarks on what he's noticed and observed on the ground in Beijing. Um, tell us about your own personal experience and sure. why yes, yeah. you think um, your presence in mainland China is no longer tolerated. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, on November 8th, I, I got word from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that my visa had been denied. They said that uh, they didn't give a reason, uh, and I think they seldom give reasons. Uh, but based on the, and you know, I had an interview at the Chinese consulate in San Francisco uh, for about an hour and a half, and the questions revolved around uh, my reporting on human rights, uh, rights defenders, the Dalai Lama, Tibet, things like that. So uh, it, it was clear to me that, you know, I might have a problem getting the visa. I waited eight months before they rejected me. But, but those questions made me, you know, kind of you know, aware that I might have a problem. Why, and, and I mean, you've been reporting in China since the 80s. Um, right. What has changed? In terms, in terms of, of the media? Mm. Well, you know, I, I, I don't, you know if, you, if we go back, I, I, I reported on China from, from Hong Kong and Taiwan for a few years, but I moved there in 1994. And I have to say that between 1994 and now, I think things have gotten worse. Um, you know, the, the, the problems that we face in reporting and, and kind of being harassed, you know, followed, monitored, you know, uh, under surveillance, that hasn't changed at all. Um, you know, we still face a lot of problems like that. Uh, but in addition now, there's intimidation via the Internet, things like that. Um, and then now, in the, in, since 2009, every year there have been people have, who've had problems getting visas approved at the end of the year. And it's a, it's a form of intimidation because it makes people worry that, well, if I'm not a good boy next year, then maybe I won't get my, my visa. You know, Now we had some 23 correspondents from the New York Times and the Washington Post who were worried about getting their visas. I understand they got their press cards, press cards at the end of the year except for one person. Um, but this doesn't mean the problem's over. We still have uh, a half dozen or more people waiting outside to come in on new journalist visas. Uh, people like Phil Pan from the New York Times and Chris Buckley from the New York Times who've been waiting more than a year. Um, you know, and then also next year we'll face this, the same problem again. There'll be more uh, people who, who they don't like or they're not happy with your reporting. They'll make you wait for the visa. Uh, and then I also, I expect actually that the intimidation will increase. That, that a lot of anger, you know, within the Ministry of Public Security, within, you know, security agencies, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and that they're going to, if they don't get their way in kind of kicking people out, then they'll find ways to make uh, life difficult for people in the hope that people will self-censor. And I think it works. If we believe the, the stories about Bloomberg censoring a story, uh, that works then. And, you know, I know that other journalists are thinking the same thing. You know, I've, I've spoken to a few journalists who said they didn't want to write anything negative in November, December until they got their visas because they were afraid it might cause a problem. When does that become people worrying about that in January, February, March, and April? You know, so so I think the situation's worse. In the 18 years I was there, it wasn't this. We never had this many people having trouble getting visas, and people like myself getting rejected, or Melissa Chan from Al Jazeera two years ago. It's it's very very rare, you know. Um, but you know, I, I think the situation is far worse today than it was in '94 when I first arrived. Tell us a little bit. I think a lot of people are interested to know what what are your plans exactly? You you in the states now? Do you want to go I back to China? I'm, I'm hoping to, to, that, uh, that Reuters will find another position for me, and I'm waiting to hear about that. I'm still talking about, about another possibility outside of China. Right. At this point, I think um, we're going to um, um, start our Q&A session. I think a lot of you have questions for the two gentlemen. Um, so if you would just put up your hand um, and maybe tell us who you are and wait for the microphone, um, um, then um, um, I'm sure we'll have a very lively um, discussion. I see two hands already. Um, sorry, I, 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 I did notice who put up his or her hand first, so why don't we go first with the lady at the back? <laughs> From what I heard, and I think it's not explicitly addressed, 
it's the taken for granted access to China. Um, and I hope to share it with my personal experience and maybe open up a discussion from a different perspective. Um, because I'm a China, mainland China, Chinese citizen, whenever, wherever I go, where, whichever country's visa I'm hoping to get, I always have to prove that I can offer to the country, I can add to the country that I'm going to. And I once was denied entry to Great Britain and was locked up for a day and finally sent back home because the immigration said I did not have an ambitious enough career plan for them to let me in. But, so because I'm Chinese, it's embedded in me that whenever I'm going, whenever it's a different foreign country, I have to show something on the table, what I have to offer, but at least I will be no harm. But from the discussion just now, it sounds like because what journalists, foreign correspondents access to China and the right to expose negative sides of the country, it's taken for granted. Like, it's never looked at, okay, I'm going to report on a foreign country, and this country may have something they want, to, want us to report on. And there's this, um, not, not that they should direct what we do, but it's the consideration is not there. And so I'm asking, they, the fact that it's taken for granted, because you're thinking you're a journalist, you're special. So you yourself is not a journalist. I am a journalist. You are a journalist. Are, are you working in Hong Kong or in Maine? I work in Hong Kong. Okay. Um, Peter, do you yeah. have anything to say to this different point of view? That's the one. Um, yes, I mean, uh, journalists are not specialist people, but um, the status that journalists enjoy, foreign correspondents enjoy, in most countries is different from that of, of ordinary immigrants or people working, seeking work. <laughs> Um, I don't know whether I, I don't think you would have been treated the way you were treated if you had gone there on a journalist visa, applying as a correspondent for a Chinese or a Hong Kong Chinese or a Hong Kong newspaper, um, because our job isn't to add to a country; our job is to report on a country. Um, and of course, this is this is an international standard, and it's one from which the Chinese media, uh, especially the Chinese state media, benefit a great deal more than we do. Um, there are thousands of Chinese news, uh, reporters around the world, hundreds and hundreds in America, and the, the Chinese media, state media, are building up their presence in the United States enormously. Um, and they're not being asked to add anything to the United States. They're simply applying for journalist visas and being given journalist visas. Um, although, actually, a number of them work on diplomatic visas, which is a little more questionable. But um, there is an understanding that a reporter goes to a country as a foreign correspondent and is not subject to the same sorts of, of immigration rules as someone who's asking to, to migrate or to, uh, to, to become a new citizen of a country. Um, Paul, have something? Paul, f f um, b before we go back to, to the lady who asked questions, Paul, do you have anything to add to that? To no, that and I think, you know, I think Peter answered that well. You know, there are some 900 uh, Chinese journalists in the United States. You can't compare uh, student visas or immigration visas with journalist visas, it should be reciprocal. We allow Chinese journalists into other countries around the world, they should allow us into, into China. I don't think that we're special, but that's how, how, how the world works. Go ahead. My follow-up question is on the disparity in reporting strength um, between Chinese media and Western media. We don't have Bloomberg, we don't have Reuters. There's only very sh pretty shabby CCTV and Xinhua news agency. It's, so do you think that reciprocity really as reflects that what, what foreign media are able to do in China, able to tell about Chinese, Chinese um, government, it's, it's far beyond what Chinese media is, are able to do in the United States? Um. <clears throat> well, I mean, there, there, there are different factors involved in how much one is able to say about a country. Um, on the one hand, there is what freedom exists to discover information uh, and to find out facts. And on the other, there is the professional skill of the journalist 
in understanding, finding, understanding that information and explaining it to his or her audience. Um, now, there are some extremely good Chinese journalists all around the world where they're allowed to actually write everything that they would want to write, I don't know. But uh, I'm sure as Chinese foreign correspondents get more experience, they will become, I mean, you say they're a bit shabby, I'm sure they will become a lot better. Um, and I don't think the United States is likely, or other Western countries, to be honest, is likely to respond to that trend by shutting down their access to information. The gentleman in front. Hi, I'm To Han Shi from the South China Morning Post. Today on the front page of Ming Pao, a Hong Kong Chinese language newspaper, there was a huge splash front page article about how the chief editor of Ming Pao newspaper suddenly got sacked and is replaced by some Malaysian person living in Singapore because the former chief editor of Ming Pao wrote, read a lot of articles critical about Hong Kong TV's uh, controversy which was implicitly critical of the government of C.Y. Leung in Hong Kong and the Chinese government, and so he was sacked for political reasons. And as a subsidiary article uh, on the front page of Ming Pao today, you had a secondary article saying that uh, you know, many newspapers, including my newspaper, the South China Morning Post, is, is being heavily influenced by Beijing, and the uh, Apple Daily article called the South China Morning Post the Red Mon uh, China Morning Post, uh, and it dragged up this two-year-old issue of the Li Wang Yang reporting by the South China Morning Post. I would like uh, Peter Ford and Paul Mooney to comment on this. Oh, what do you want me to comment so what is, on? What's what is your question? question? Do, you, do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? You know? Disagree with... Um, what the, uh, the front page of Ming Pao is saying that more and more Hong Kong newspapers are, are being heavily influenced by either the Hong Kong government or the Beijing government and editors in Hong Kong are being sacked. Well, I, mean, I don't know reasons. if it's a question that um, the two of you are... Um, either to comment on since neither one of you works in Hong Kong. Um, but um, Peter, do you have anything to... I, I'm sorry, I just don't know enough about it to be able mm. to, to say anything mm. sensible. Paul might. Yeah. Paul? Yeah, I, I don't really have much to say either. I don't cover Hong Kong, um, and so I'm not in a position to, mm. to talk about this. But what I've heard from speaking to, to Chinese journalists in Hong Kong and other people, it seems that that's the case. And, and may, may, may I just ask him, if, so you work at the South China Morning Post. What's your view? Steve Vines, I think you have a question first. Uh, my question is on a, a slightly different subject. You, you, you know that practically everybody um, who's a foreign correspondent in, in China, or at least a majority, have mainland assistants who work with them, so often helping to translate or facilitate interviews, this sort of thing. My, my question is about this. I'm wondering what sort of pressure they are under. And also, there's been many suggestions that a lot of these people are, in fact, put there by the security services to monitor the work that the journalists themselves are doing. So I want, on the one hand, to know whether you have a view on that. And secondly, um, it seems to me in some cases, they, they are put under pressure where they're far more exposed than the correspondent themselves. <coughs> Peter, um, I think the first. Shall I start, Paul? Is that right? Um, yes, clearly. Um, uh, the Chinese employees of uh, foreign newspapers and foreign media um, are put under pressure sometimes. Not all of them, not all the time. Um, but there are definitely... Uh, occasions on which they are, quote, invited to drink tea uh, with different parts of the security services uh, and asked to basically tell them what is going on, what sort of stories the correspondent is working on, this sort of thing. Um, there have been reports that uh, sometimes it's more than that, that threats have been made to some of these people that, uh, that their families, their relatives might find it hard to get a promotion, uh, this sort of thing. Um, I mean, my own feeling about it is that if the authorities want to know what I'm working on, they read the Christian Science Monitor. Um, <clears throat> it's a big website. Um, the second point you raised about whether or not they're placed there by the Chinese authorities, I think that may have been a concern in the past when uh, we were not allowed to choose our own employees. Uh, we are now allowed to choose our employees. Technically, I mean, they are, as a technical matter, employed by 
the, the DSB for secure, social security issues and all the rest of it, but we are free to choose them where we like and make our own judgment on whether or not we want to apply them. So it's up to us to decide whether we think there's any risk at all that they have been placed there. My own feeling is that that is not a problem anymore at all, but that they are, yes, subject to, to official pressure. Paul. Oh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I've known of many cases where news assistants were invited to tea by uh, public security officials where they asked the same questions, you know, tell us what your boss is doing, what story he's working on, where he's going. Um, it's my understanding that a lot of the assistants kind of, you know, say, okay, okay I'll do it, but I don't think that they do. Um, I, I don't think it's been a problem in recent years, um, but it is intimidating. And, and people have told me where they said, oh, we hear your son didn't do well on the university exam, or we, we hear your mother was in the hospital. This is meant to intimidate people, to frighten people, you know. Um, so it's something that is probably not a, as big of a problem as it was before when we were required to hire through government agencies, but it's still a, still a, a problem. Is it getting harder then to find young people who would um, be willing to work for a foreign <laughs> news organization in China? I don't get the impression it is. I think there's still a lot of people who want an opportunity to do this kind of work. Uh, Terry, you have a question? Hi, Terry, Terry Nealon. I have a question for Paul. Uh, Paul, have you received any indication that the Hong Kong authorities would welcome you being uh, stationed here? Uh, I, I wouldn't anticipate there would be any problem. I think Hong Kong is still fairly open. I mean, I, I have heard of Chinese journalists, uh, such as uh, uh, Zhang Ping, uh, who was trying to take a position in Hong Kong, uh, not being able to get a work visa. But I think for Westerners, I don't think it would be a problem. I've not heard of anyone having a problem. Uh, so I, I anticipate that if I wanted to go to work in Hong Kong, that I'd be able to do that. But I, I won't know unless I try to do that. Yeah. Uh, Francis, you have a question for Paul. Uh, hi, Paul. Uh, Francis Moriarty here. Uh, Paul, you, you were a, a multiple prize winner from the Human Rights Press Awards. In fact, you won a, a handful of them on the day before you were sacked from the South China Morning Post, as I... As I right. Uh, That's correct. We, yes. We, do you feel that when you were called in, and, or you had this conversation in San Francisco, I think you said, about right. uh, what some of the reasons might be, do you think that some of the stories for which you were given an, an award for their quality were actually some of the same stories for which you had your visa denied? Uh, you know, I, 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 I imagine so, because um, those were, the stories that I had the awards for were, were, were some of the best stories I did. They were on issues like you know, black kilns, kidnap kids, about AIDS, about uh, the, the plight of the handicapped, um, and uh, the asbestos problem. So these were big, you know, problems in China that weren't being, you know, uh, weren't allowed to be reported in the local media. Um, and I can imagine, based on the questions they asked me, you know, it gave me the impression that obviously it was based on the human rights reporting that, I, that I'd done. Thank you. Um, ah, Jit. You have a question. Um, Pete Trimble, th thanks so much for joining us today. Y you've both spoken um, about your belief that the um, climate for press freedom and, and, and specifically for foreign correspondence has worsened down the years. Um, do you think it's, 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 it's worsened significantly uh, under Xi Jinping uh, coming to office? Do you think, uh, do you get the sense that um, they're speaking um, from a position of strength. The world, the world's media are clamoring to report on China. They're aware of this. They know this full well. Um, and they're, they're putting the squeeze on now. So, um, and, and do you see that, do you see any signs of, of hope that that might uh, ameliorate it at any point? I mean, it's, it's hard to judge because, of course, <clears throat> one of the big problems with the the, the, the visa delays was that the authorities never gave the slightest indication as to why they were doing it. There was no official explanation of this, um, which obliges us, really. I mean, it, it, it leads one to the conclusion almost inevitably that it had something to do with what the New York Times and Bloomberg published. Um, and I think in that, well, I talked earlier of red lines. There, uh, there, are, there are clearly a number of red lines, but the red line around senior officials' private lives and their families' private lives is one that I think is, 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 is very clearly defined. Um, 
the red line around the sorts of human rights issues that Paul has, has written about so extensively and so well um, has in the past been a bit fuzzier, and I think it remains somewhat fuzzier. Um, and when it comes down to it, uh, the sorts of stories that Bloomberg and the New York Times did are very particular stories, and the fact that they came out the year before last uh, recently, I think, is to do with the fact that this was really the first time that any Western news agencies, news organizations, with the um, ability to publish stories like this, uh, put together in the same time and place the motivation to investigate, the skilled resources, the skilled journalists, uh, the time and the money it, that it takes to do this. I mean, these reporters worked for months and months and months and months to get what they got. Um, that had not been the case before. And to be perfectly honest, there aren't very many international news organizations who have those resources and who are prepared to devote them to this sort of story. Uh, so I think the majority of, uh, of foreign correspondents in China are not going to face that particular sort of problem. But Paul... Paul, do you have anything to add? No, no, I don't. Okay. No. Tara. Peter and Paul, thanks again for joining us today. A question about what maybe we can expect in the year ahead. And, and Peter, I believe you met with Joe Biden of the United States on his visit to China. Do you have any sense that we're going to be in a tit-for-tat situation where maybe journalists from China working in the States <coughs> will begin to have a harder time working there and that the situation is going to progress and worsen over the course of the year? And I wonder what your view is from the vantage point in the United States on that, Paul, as well. Paul, would like to go first this time? Paul, would you like to go first? You I'm sorry, you're talking to me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, sorry, I can't see because you're looking in a different direction. You know, I, I think uh, the situation has changed in the last few months. Um, you know, a combination of things. I think it was the fact that I didn't get a visa. More important was that you had two dozen people from Bloomberg and, and the New York Times uh, being threatened. Um, uh, you know, I've heard from people in Washington that there are congressmen that are starting to pay attention to this. I understand this may be a topic in the, during the uh, approval of the, of the, of the next uh, ambassador to China. Um, uh, I was, I've, had, I've had contact with people in Washington, and it seems like that the U.S. is getting a bit frustrated. I'm not saying and I'm not advocating refusing visas for Chinese journalists, but you can delay visas for replacements. You can delay visas for uh, uh, senior media officials who aren't involved in the day-to-day -day collection of news. Uh, are in you know propaganda officials who are going, or, or, or people from the Public Security Bureau who are, are, are responsible for these areas. So I think there are other things that can happen, and I actually think that if it does happen, that China will 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 fold immediately. I don't think you know it's never had no one's ever stood up to them on issues like this. And I think if if Washington or London or Paris or anyone takes a stand on this, that you know that China will blink first. Peter. Um. Well, as a, an organization of, of, of foreign journalists, of, of journalists to uh, court, we in, in the Beijing FCCC do not support uh, tit for tat or, or reciprocal treatment um, on the visa question, simply because we don't think that uh, the efforts on one party's side to restrict press freedom uh, are best met with efforts by another party to restrict press freedom. Um, but as Paul says, this is an issue of increasing concern in Washington. Uh, as he said, congressmen are getting interested in it. Uh, and I think it made a difference that Joe Biden, when he was in uh, China, not only addressed it specifically with uh, President Xi Jinping, but also raised the issue publicly. It was when he talked to the, I think it was the American Chamber of Commerce, but he publicly raised this question, that it became a story. It became a big issue. Uh, until then, nobody had said anything because Bloomberg's corporate policy is never to say anything uh, for its own reasons. And the New York Times was being cautious. Uh, Joe Biden made it a public issue, and I think that made a difference. And it is now a public issue, and it will stay a public issue. And I think that means it will, uh, yeah, that people will be paying, paying more attention to it. Um, Douglas. Um, 
Uh, most of the microphone. It's coming. Yeah. I can hear you, but San Francisco can't. <laughs> Hi, Douglas Wong. Um, we've talked a lot about the, uh, the uh, Western media and their experiences. I'm, I'm just wondering, one of the big things we're really, a lot, that some people are worried about this year is some kind of mess up between China and Japan, some accident, some mishap. How are our, our the Japanese foreign correspondents doing in China? And uh, I mean, what, uh, it, it, you know, are, we, we've, you know, the other groups of foreign correspondents. Uh, I, I can imagine that Japanese correspondents in, in China now are having a, as unpleasant a time as anyone else. But uh, what, 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 what are the things that the FCC China is most concerned about? And what, if anything, can we do here in Hong Kong to help? Um, the Japanese press corps, yes, um, has its own very particular problems at the moment. And individual Japanese newspapers have uh, this very much the same sorts of problems as, uh, as of Western organization, news organizations when it comes to uh, getting new visas, replacing correspondence, and this sort of thing. Um, and it would, I don't read Japanese, but my understanding is that the newspapers which are having suffering unexpected delays uh, in, in getting their visas are newspapers whose political line is um, met with disapproval in Beijing, put it this way. Um, but when it comes to, uh, to actual some reporting on the ground, um, uh, Japanese photographers are particularly daring. Um, and they have borne the brunt of a lot of the physical violence. Um, when it comes to the more political atmosphere, I've not heard of Japanese reporters being denied access to news sources specifically because they're Japanese. Um, but then the Japanese press corps tends not to publicize its problems uh, quite as gaily and as freely as Western newspapers do. Uh, and I would not be at all surprised if, uh, if, if Japanese newspapers and, and, and television were finding access to officials just as hard as Japanese diplomats are finding access to Chinese officials difficult. I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to add something. You know, uh, it's not just American reporters that are having problems. Since, since I was refused my visa, I've heard of other reporters from other countries being refused. A lot of times we don't hear about things because news organizations are afraid to make a fuss over these things. If they speak out, they go public with it, they fear that China will retaliate, it will become even more difficult for them. Uh, the other thing is that, what has been mentioned, but is that even the Chinese media is under attack. The Chinese media, uh, since last January, so from the, after the Nanfang incident, um, has been muzzled more than I've seen them in, in many, many years. And the, the microblogs, which were bustling a while ago, are, have now basically fallen silent, at least as far as the, what they call the big V, the, you know, the, the VIP bloggers, the well-known people like Charles Xu had 12 million followers. Um, they're all laying low. Um, the government's really cracked down across the board on, on freedom of expression in China. And we've got time for two more questions. Gentleman on the left. Uh, Richard Volstek from AmCham. Uh, this is for Paul Mooney. Uh, uh, Paul, we mentioned, you mentioned a bit about the U.S. Congress being involved and so forth, but going forward, uh, what other pressure points or organizations, uh, uh, what kinds of things can be done in the states to uh, improve the situation by adding public pressure? I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. Uh, looking for, uh, you mentioned congressional inquiries on the visa issue and Joe Biden's trip, of course. But what other things can be done on the U.S. side through uh, organizations uh, in addition to the Congress that may help uh, turn the tide of the current trend? Yeah. Well, I think it would help a lot if international media organizations would stand up together and take a stand. Um, you know, Bloomberg is a major target. Their terminal sales are down. Their website is blocked in the U.S. Um, uh, New York Times websites are blocked. Um, but we don't see the international media standing up and taking a stand together. It's, you know, it's China's using divide and conquer. Um, but I think if the major news organizations would speak out, then China wouldn't feel that it could, it could, that it could, that it could isolate people and attack them. You know, the, um, Bloomberg's not made one comment yet about the fact that its reporters can't get visas, about, uh, about the, you know, they have about a half dozen people waiting outside to come in on visas. They may, never went public with the fact that 
you know, a dozen or so reporters couldn't come in. Uh, the New York Times has also been fairly quiet about it, but they have reported on those issues, but they haven't, I haven't seen any public statements, you know. So if the media itself doesn't speak up, then, then it's difficult. But I still think, I think if you, if the U.S. government, it's limited, what can it do? You know, talk doesn't work. We've been talking for years, you know, this kind of quiet diplomacy, it's what China wants, but it never works. It never has an impact. And I, like I said, I'm not saying don't give visas to Chinese journalists, don't throw them out, but if we, if we sit on the application for the next, you know, person, bureau chief from Xinhua, from People's Daily, they still have somebody there. They still have the people. They're just not able to bring in new people. That's what they're doing to us right now. And, you know, I know that, you know, in the U.S. we say we're not in favor of uh, limiting freedom of expression, but it's being limited now. And it's not going to be improved until we, we take some kind of reciprocal action. And, and once we do, within a few weeks, it'll be a much b better playing field. And it hasn't been for, you know, for decades. Francis, um, I give you the last question. Yeah, Paul, thanks. You, you touched on the question I was going to ask about right there with the issue of, of reciprocity. Um, it's a very controversial issue w within the profession, uh, but it's also wider than just journalism because we're hearing reports, and maybe Peter could comment on this as well, of visa denials to people who are academics. Uh, to people who want to research in other areas. Uh, there may be visa denials as well to people in the business community, but we don't hear about them because the business community tends to shut up about it and try to play quiet. Uh, uh, and how often that really works, we'll, we, we just don't know. Uh, but we just know that when it comes to people held uh, inside, people from Hong Kong held inside China under various forms of detention, the number annually is around, for every year that we've ever looked, it's been more than 400 a year that the Hong Kong government's aware of, and they're all business people. They're not journalists. So I think the issue goes wider than simply journalists. Uh, and, and my question is, what do you hear about, for example, academics and book authors uh, having to excise chapters or, or refuse visas? Yeah, no, this has been a big problem for a long time, too. Uh, there are, I, I know of dozens of Western academics who can't get into China for things that they've written or often they don't know the reason. I, I, like with journalists, no reason is ever given. Uh, you know, there, there's a book called uh, Xinjiang, China's Muslim Borderland, I believe. Fourteen contributors to the book. Thirteen of them have, have had trouble getting into China since that book came out and was probably six or seven years ago. Uh, they're just not allowed in. Uh, other prominent scholars, Andy Nathan of Columbia, uh, uh, Perry Link, um, they've been banned for years. They can't get in, you know. Um, so it's it's a wider problem than just journalists. And a lot of a lot of journal, a lot of academics won't talk about it because they're afraid that it'll make the situation worse. And I reported on this a few years ago. And when I approached some of the people that I knew that couldn't get visas, they refused to speak with me. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Um, I have a little souvenir here for Peter. Unfortunately, Paul, I'll have to save yours for when you're next in town. Thank you. Thank you very much well, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you.